Good morning and uh, welcome to all uh, to uh, live peripheral interventions uh, broadcasting from the cardiac uh, catheterization uh, laboratory from uh, Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. I'm Dr. Sandeep Singla, your moderator for this case. Uh, the video of this broadcast will be available on the website later today. The last broadcast from April 24 and all the previous uh, peripheral cases are available now on www.ccclivecases.org. Uh, we would love to hear from you, so please email us with any questions or concerns or suggestions about this case or any prior cases at uh, www.ccclivecases.org website. Uh, we have one announcement. Uh, we have a link Mount Sinai uh, conference coming up, which will take place on June 11th and 12th, with the endovascular fellows course taking place uh, the day prior on uh, Monday, the June 10th. Uh, you can register for the fellows course at uh, www.cccsymposium.org. And for the link Mount Sinai at www.linkmountsinai.org. And uh, coming back to our case today, we have a very good uh, case of uh, long uh, SFA ISR. So let me take you to Dr. Krishnan and his team at uh, Mount Sinai Cath Lab. Good morning, Dr. Krishnan and team. Good morning, good morning. Um, I, I want to introduce, um, and uh, first of all, Karthik and I are incredibly excited that Dr. Singla has decided to moderate this today. <laughs> Um, um, that was a surprise. No, that, that my God. Good, it was a pleasant surprise. Uh, <laughs> it's always, always good to have something new. So to everybody in the, out there, you know, this, will, this is going to be um, Dr. Singla's last uh, live, live case moderation with us. Uh, Dr. Singla has, uh, d for, for multiple reasons, has decided to leave Mount Sinai, is going to be joining uh, Dr. Gary Ansel's group um, in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, I spoke with Dr. Ansel, who is incredibly excited to have Dr. Singla join him, and of course, Karthik, myself, the entire team here at Sinai is gonna miss Dr. Singla. He's been an incredible uh, addition, and you, albeit everyone. for one year, but uh, so we, we decided to honor him with, uh, uh, with the, uh, with the uh, live case uh, moderation today, which uh, we're excited to have. But anyway, we, but thanks again, but we're ready to start. Couple of, couple of shopkeeping notes. Um, you know, we have an incredible conference coming up on June 10th, 11th, and 12th. June 10th, Dr. Guja, Dr. Kapoor, Dr. Baska, Prashotam uh, are, are, are leading our, our endovascular fellows course, um, uh, which uh, we have over 50 fellows already enrolled. Um, uh, actually, much more than that. I think 62 was the last check. Yeah. And I got to tell you that, you know, it's, it's really become one of the premier fellows courses, and I'm going to say that, just because, you know, it's totally focused on endovascular and the endovascular approach to peripheral arterial disease, which I think is phenomenal. Second thing, uh, what the, the, the guys have done and really amazing is put together a schedule that involves both surgeons, radiologists, cardiologists, so it's truly multidisciplinary. Second, that'll be followed up by our, our, our third link, Mount Sinai. Obviously, we've been doing our, 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 our course as part of uh, Dr. Sharma's CCC uh, uh, V course for multiple years since 2004, but, uh, but this is our third link, Mount Sinai. It's probably going to be the best. We've got multiple things to talk about, controversies, and again, our very own Dr. Guja is leading an OBL session which I think is very exciting for everyone out there where I think that, you know, the outpatient lab has really kind of become one of the standards of care for treatment of, say, not very, very complex peripheral arterial disease where things can be managed in an outpatient, it's cost effective, the patients like it better, environment is better, cases are done faster. Like in Sinai, for instance, cases take a long time to turn over the rooms. I know with most OBLs especially, uh, they're, they're much faster than that. But I think that's gonna bring up a lot of controversies on the future, reimbursement, so many and so, so on and so forth. Finally, in Link Mount Sinai, beyond the external live cases, we're going to have we're going to have the the Paclitaxel Town Hall, which I think is going to be phenomenal. Uh, we're going to have Dr. Lawrence Garcia lead the town hall, along with um, you know all the the PIs from all the different uh, trials, uh, which uh, which are going to answer some of the difficult questions regarding Paclitaxel. So, for instance, Dr. Garcia will be moderating. Dr. Gray, Dr. Scheinert, who is part of Lutonics, Dr. Gray, who is the leader of Imperial, myself uh, uh, for Stellarex, uh, and Dr. John Laird for 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 the uh, for the um, excuse me the uh, impact impact and and the cook uh, uh, leaders will also be there so we'll have everybody for the entire uh, uh, you know all the different uh, how can you say trials will be there to answer questions the one last exciting part is uh, two more things I want to just give you an overview before we get into this case we have the expert exchange forum which has been a huge success 
We have about 18 outside physicians who are presenting their cases, uh, who've already submitted individual research cases, so on and so forth, which is a great opportunity for all of us to interact on a, on a community level as well as, you know, on an, on an international level, which will be great. And, and the, the, the unique part of Link Mount Sinai this year is that we have a vascular industry forum where there have already been about, I think, 20 questions submitted um, to ask the industry, which I think now you also will be able to ask them live. We have all the leaders from Medtronic, uh, Philips, Cook, Boston Scientific, Abbott will be up there, and, and you can go ahead and ask them the questions that you need to, really regarding Paclitaxel. So, so I, I, I think that this is a good opportunity for us to come, come to New York, enjoy June, and learn a lot, and work with us to really improve the field of endovascular medicine. Now, after that long introduction, you know my team, you know Dr. Guja, you know Asma, who's graduating very soon, will likely be staying in New York and, uh, and provide excellent care here. Ray Lascano behind us, and then we have a wonderful team, Ashley, who decided to grace us today, and Ashley's trainee, who your name, my dear? Ali. Ali is also here, and of course we have Ramon. So after the long introduction, we're going to turn it over to Asma to, to introduce the case. Good morning, everybody. So uh, we have a very interesting case for you today. It's a 64-year-old male with past medical history of diabetes, CKD, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, CAD, prior cabbage in uh, 2018, uh, PVD and multiple PTAs, last being, uh, actually la last being just la a few months ago this, this uh, in December of last year. Uh, an iliac intervention was done, former smoker who actually quit just two months ago. His most recent presentation was with a non-healing ulcer of his right fifth toe which is relatively new. It's, it's been there or for a few weeks and uh, it, it's not been healing. Um, and basically also complains of, uh, also complains of uh, significant rest pain. Usual medications, you, you know, diabetes, antihyperlipidemics, uh, anti aspirin plavix. Um, uh, ABIs are pretty significantly diminished on the on the uh, right side, 0.62, and on the left, it's 0.84. Next. This is his runoff of the right side as seen in January. So basically, flush, uh, I mean, ostially occluded ISR CTO of the entire, uh, entire uh, uh, right SFA. This was a Everflex stand that was placed in 2000 and, um, 2015, I think. And um, uh, it, uh, although it doesn't uh, uh, show very well there, but the, he has excellent three vessel runoff uh, uh, infra, infra pop. Infra pop. Uh, next. And this is a picture of the proximal and the distal caps of the, SF, uh, of the SFA CTO. Um, next. And uh, this is our strategy for today. So we are going left CFA access. Uh, we chose um, seven French, 45 centimeter, 45 centimeter sheet uh, therapeutic anticoagulation as we mostly do Angiomax. We're going to do IVUS as is our protocol in most of the ISR cases. We, we perform IVUS to, to look at what's going on intravascularly. And then also we uh, uh, up here also do uh, uh, throm some sort of a uh, thr thr uh, thr thrombectomy of these lesions. Um, either Angiojet or Penumbra. And we, as our um, uh, protocol dictates, we also use Embushield filters and, and filter in these cases. Uh, most of the times, uh, I think today we are, uh, once we are successfully crossed, we are going to do, uh, use an, uh, a laser, uh, well, well, laser. You know, I, I think we should stop there, Asma. Okay. And, and like we said, complex case, very difficult to access. That's why we started a little bit late. Um, and, and I gotta tell you, so we, we've got, we're in the stand here. And I, and I w just want to show you the nub of the stand so you can see. So this is the runoff. He's got two vessels to the foot, Sandeep. Yeah. He's got a posterior tibial and a, um, an anterior tibial. I just want you guys to see it. Dominant PT. He's developed ulcers since he was a claudicant. We just fixed his iliacs. We didn't fix his ISR in the past. You can see here he's got um, three vessel runoff uh, with the popper tail that fills very, very slowly. And you'll see it very slowly. And then you can see actually the collateral beating the native pop down. And then he's got an AT and a PT, and you can mm -hmm. see the geniculates doing their job in this case. 
you can see that the stent is occluded distally, and I'm just going to play this one here. And you can see, actually, the next one is the right one. Okay. And you can see here that the stent is gone, no evidence of stent fracture. And you can see the distal um, available right at that spot. So, so my, 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 my entire process of doing this case today, as you can see that, is how do we now, with the paclitaxel difficulties that we've had, you know, whether you believe it or not, or Katsana's data is something that, that you really believe or not, is a different story. The question is, what do you, what do, you do in this situation where, get us a Terumo Navicross, guys, in this situation with, uh, with, uh, with paclitaxel? How do you deal with this? So first of all, let, let me start first with the meta-analysis, right? So, so uh, we, we've kind of not really beaten it up enough, uh, but I mean, I, obviously there is, a, there is a paclitaxel signal. So let's ask everybody in this room, including Asma, who is just about to graduate, what are your thoughts on this? Let's start with Asma. Asma, what are your thoughts on this meta-analysis that's going on? I mean, do, do, is, it, is it, first and foremost, what, what, what do you, do you believe the meta-analysis? Do you think it's going to change your practice when you graduate? Uh, and how do you interpret this? And how are you going to approach the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the claudication, claudication uh, in, your, in, your, in your practice? So uh, obviously the data as a graduating fellow, it's very mm -hmm. restricting and it's kind of disappointing because it's limited the stuff that you can do. So it's well, first it's of all, tell me about the data. What, do you believe the meta-analysis? Do you think it was a well-done meta-analysis? What you know? What what are the things you you see in that meta-analysis? Oh, oh, careful, careful. So we have uh -huh. uh, we have dissected that meta-analysis like yep. two uh, yep. two live cases yep. ago, mm -hmm. and you know we talked about it in in, in great detail. The thing Sorry. is, there there is a mortality signal. Whether or not you know that is something. Um, Real or not is, I guess, yet to be determined. But but it was That's real it. enough yeah. for um, yeah. FDA to uh, you know to come up with a warning letter right. for the right. for the doctors. So I guess it will you know it, it will restrict the way I practice definitely. And you know un unless there is something that n that new comes up between now and then, which will you know which will refute what what the meta analysis showed. But definitely there was a mortality signal, and Hold so I, I, would, I would say that, yes, it, it's ah, going to be yeah, practice well. changing, and it's going to, you know, okay. it's kind of progressed our fields like 10 years. Right, if it is, so. it's a problem. But Cindy, wh what are your thoughts on it? I know you've looked at it like Asma and me, and you've got an opinion, obviously. So what's your, what's your feeling on this? So, uh, you know, uh, uh -huh. regarding uh, Castano's paper, mm -hmm. that meta-analysis, now what wow. he did was a uh, not a patient level analysis. It, uh -huh. it was a meta-analysis oh, right, yeah. of the you know, overall uh, results from the studies. Uh -huh. And these studies were not powered for, uh, to give a mortality analysis at five years. Mm -hmm. okay. So that is one in terms of like, uh, that was not the primary outcome. That's what I'm doing, yeah. And what I understand you know, from the recent literature which has come out to give a mortality mm -hmm. analysis or a, to power uh, to uh, uh, to a signal that will have a meaningful statistical relevance, we need about a 6,000 patient enrollment, which is a big number. Right. So that is one. Number two is, you know, if I, even if I ignore uh, mm -hmm. Castano's paper, uh, what concerns me more is uh, when initial FDA, there, there were uh, two parts to FDA uh, what came out. Initial was a suggestion. They just, you know, after Castano's paper, they gave a letter that there should be a concern but they didn't kind of uh, go Sorry. into more details. We were still using it. What really kind of uh, brought this into limelight is the second FDA letter where they did their own meta-analysis. And to my understanding, that is still not patient level analysis. And where they showed the absolute mortality uh, uh, was 20% in the PTX arm versus, uh, if I believe it's about 13 to 14% in the non-PTX arm. So that's the absolute difference of about 7% at five years and about a 50% relative uh, increased mortality. Now again, you know, these are studies which were not powered for uh, uh, mortality analysis, but is there a signal? I believe so. You know, it's coming from FDA and uh, that's a warning letter. Has it changed my thought process and practice? It has. You know, I'm very, uh, I think more about it. It gives me a food for thought that why it's happening. And I think that's the reason uh, all the industry and uh, yeah. Yeah, looks like it costs. Yeah. And uh, they are uh, doing a patient level analysis. So I'll be very interested in uh, looking at what happens when they do a patient level analysis uh, presentation. Uh, does it change my practice? Let's do another view. It does. You know, uh, I think we practice in a very uh, litigious uh, kind of uh, environment. 
and uh, with okay. this FDA letter, uh, we are changing our uh, consent process. We are limiting uh, drug uh, coated therapy to high risk cases. Yeah, you're not I mean, you're so not that would be my take on it. You know, I would wait for patient level analysis. I know any new study uh, is going to take at least five years before we get the mm -hmm. results, mortality uh, mm -hmm. outcomes at five years, five to seven years. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would say. You know, let's see how the uh, individual patient analysis uh, comes. Karthik, what are you thinking? So, uh, I mean, at this point of time, I completely agree with Sandeep, right? I mean, with the data we have, the first FDA warning was, I mean, we, we could have ignored that first uh, Karsana's paper, but the second FDA warning is what gives the concern. Uh, but I think uh, if you really look at it, somebody is, uh, I think oh, age makes a difference here if somebody is old. And if you think, you Very know, good point. Very good if, point. if you think they are like 75 years old, and at this, at that point of time, if claudication or critical limb is there, and that's what's limiting there, uh, you're talking about make or break situation here. I think DCB is okay. You can use it as long as the patients are explained the risk. Yes. Yes. Uh, because yeah. they will outlay. They will. I think they will out uh, outlive their or co complications from the DCB. Mm -hmm. Or uh, if so, which is very rare. Uh, I think at this point of time, you have to take it with a pinch of salt and decide when to use it and when not to use it. I yeah. think clearly on a 40-year-old or a 50-year-old, this is that's not the right move, mm -hmm. right? But somebody who's above 70, mm -hmm. um, and you're talking about you know saving the leg versus looking at the risk of uh, complication of uh, DCB. I think we are, I think that's what I would take on, uh, yeah. based on the patient at this point of time. So uh, that would be one variable, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think age, young patient, and you know we kind of alluded to that. Yeah. So we have mortality which starts separating at three and it keeps on separating at five. Right. Now the question arises is if the but, mortality but, curve separates but, at ten. But, that's wait, but wait a second. Let, let's 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 have a let's have a, a real thought on this. Okay? okay, we're talking about we're talking about a lot of flaws in this data. Okay? That's, right. that's true. His, that is, is very true. His dose, yeah. his dose calculation was way off. Right? Mm -hmm. His uh, his fact that is um, uh, what is it called? Uh, it, it, he uh, he over he overestimated. The, uh, the dosage, the, the dosage yeah. in, in all the DCBs, and he said that increasing yeah. dose, increasing dose causes increasing mortality. Uh, increasing mortality. Little, little die now. Yeah, yeah I think through. that was so, too so, far of a so, conclusion. So, yeah. so, that, so that's one, right? Yeah. Second thing I have a problem with is if if, if you look at Medtronic's patient level data mm -hmm. that uh, yeah. that's out there. No, we're not in. Okay. If you look at Medtronic's patient level data that's out there, which they they're, they're going to publish with the uh, with the FDA that I saw in Dr. Schneider's meeting last la, last mm -hmm. week, mm -hmm. okay. The the, the 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 key point mm -hmm. is yeah. is yeah. that is that now okay now give me an 018 uh, uh, 018 Trailblazer is not going to go. What where is this, Dr. This is just a confidence there. Oh, Dr. Guja has ate his breakfast today. Good, yeah. excellent. All right, excellent. Yeah. So 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 if you look, what's that noise? And that's a vert, uh, that's a Navicross or a Vertib? Whoa. What catheter, uh, what is the tracking catheter we have? No. Okay, so, I'm so sorry. So, uh, you see that, that there was a Navicross and now, now put an O3. Oh, give me a, um, um, a, a bare wire, put a bare wire down. So, let, let me just go on with this before we talk here. Well, I'm going to have Guja, Dr. Guja put in a uh, filter for us. Take a nice shot below Karthik, identify the landing zones. So, so, the point is, if you look at, so the dose calculation was off. Second, he assumed that, that all the events were going to take a bell-shaped curve, right? So if you look at it, the problem is he, he used all statistical... Whoops. New glove. He used normal statistical methods to calculate this, which you cannot. He basically assumed that that'd be a bell-shaped curve. That, and, and the problem is if you look at it, there is not... It, this doesn't apply in two years, and it definitely doesn't apply in three and five years. That paclitaxel was going to be constant over time. So if you look at the paclitaxel, as we all know, paclitaxel doesn't is not constant over time. Most of it is gone at five years, and there's no there's no ability to explain what happened. You know, you can't have a, a plausible mechanism. You could argue that in in the paclitaxel, all the paclitaxel studies in the coronaries, there was a mortality signal. We thought that they may have been through stent thrombosis. I don't know if I'm correct here, Sandeep. You correct me if I'm wrong. But 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 I really wow. believe that that you can't extrapolate the coronary data with the peripheral data. I and think the dosage it's, was so low in the, the coronary. Dose, yeah, the, like super low compared to what right. we use. Yeah. So so yes, is there a concern? Absolutely. But yes, you know, that's but, an unexplained signal again. Yeah. There's an unexplained signal. I'm not saying there is, but you cannot withdraw a therapy that has revolutionized uh, uh, our, our field for this.
Now, I debated Joe Mills at uh, the PALP meeting, and Dr. Mills is somebody I respect tremendously, and he had a lot of good points. And his point was, listen, this is a Claudican population, right? So, so my question is, what are we going to do in, in cases where, where, where you have a high-risk uh, situation like this? So here's a patient who has instant resnosis, who we left alone because of his instant resnosis, fixed his inflow disease, and then he developed critical limb ischemia. Very low number. But now this is a high-risk population. Long segment SFAs, we're not gonna bypass. These, we know bypass has a mortality. We know that bypasses also go down. So unless they have ulcers, you're not gonna bypass SFA disease. So do we not treat these patients? I think you have to give maximum medical therapy, but I think that the FDA overshot its boundary here. I think that we need to really hunker down educate the patient that there is a signal and find out the cause. I think the FDA panel is gonna tell us a lot uh, in the next two weeks, but I don't think they're gonna come out and say, hey, Paclitaxel is safe or, pac or get Paclitaxel off the shelf. They're gonna put, put end right in the middle and leave it up to us and probably have some sort of uh, you know, clinical registry in which we're gonna have to follow these patients out to five years. So, so th this is my take and I could not agree with Dr. Guja Mo more. I think that you know the age of the patient really matters. If you have a 45-year-old male and you have a mortality signal, well, hey, you know what? You, you may want to consider other therapies. So, so the issue here really just becomes what, what, what the situation is. So that, that, that's kind of my take on it. And I think a lot of the cardiologists agree with that. A lot of the vascular surgeons don't. So I think that it's going to be very interesting to see what the panel decides uh, for us. So having said that, in, in, do you think there's any future therapies? Should we be investigating Lemus drugs? Should we be investigating, I don't know, other therapies, uh, PQ bypass, things like that? Should, we, should I have done a PQ bypass on this case? And, and, done a, you know, and uh, this way I don't have to use a, a, another therapy. And, and that's my question. First, let's talk about other technologies like Lemus. <coughs> what are your thoughts? So I think Lemus, uh, if I, uh, you know, you can correct me on that, but there was a trial uh, in... Uh, mid, uh, like late 2000s, I think Sirocco. Sirocco one, yeah. yeah. And the problem with the Lemus trial, it was a negative trial. They didn't get any, uh, you know, risk of restenosis was no lower oh. than a balloon angioplasty. So I it came. Laser first. And I, you know, uh, and the like problem a is a Lemus group oh, of drugs we'll is very anyway. uh, uh, hydrophilic right. compared to Paclitaxel, which is a very lipophilic. Oh, one run of Angie did. Let's see how Now, works. they got, you know, in coronary Lemus group has been a, like, it's been a revolutionary, it's mm -hmm. changed the field, but the idea is they, we use a polymer and we use a retaining. Uh, so are we gonna uh, develop new stents which will have a Lemus group of drugs with the polymer there? You know, that's something uh, that's thought provoking. We, uh, I won't say no, until we do it, we don't know what's gonna be the result of that. Mm -hmm. So that is one technology, yeah. Uh, you know, to answer that uh, Lemus, right. but pure Lemus drug on a it. bare, uh, on a, a metal, Will that's not gonna work, that we know. Well, you know, you know, I, I got to be honest with you, you know, and I think this is an excellent opportunity for the field to grow, right? Yeah. You know, you definitely want to be able to to have the ability to develop new drugs just the way we did in the coronary liter uh, yeah. coronaries, right? Yeah. So, so I think I think that that's very you can let go. Uh, I think that's very very important for us, and I think this is the opportunity. And so we're just gonna we're gonna do this on on with the Angiojet, on. So that's, you know, to uh, highlight what we do at Sinai is mm -hmm. uh, once we have an ISR segment and depending on how the wire crosses, we have, uh, Dr. Krishnan has I a protocol it. which we pretty much use in every ISR case, especially long segment. We run an angiojet, which is a rheolytic uh, uh, thrombectomy device. And then we take Going. a picture. A lot of different and if there is still a uh, thrombus load, then we run a penumbra. So we kind of, this is our... Uh, very established protocol which we are doing right now so so the theory behind is th off. off the theory behind it is that you're going to have pop pockets of fibrosis followed by pockets of clot in this case Guja, dr guja and myself don't think it's going to be that way because the wire was so difficult to cross <coughs> but you still can't be sure so mm -hmm. you know he's trying to advance this and if it doesn't go we're going to give up but you can see it is moving yeah i think and the mid segment of uh, wire went easy so let's right see, yeah, let's right see, here you, know, you can see here yeah. that that the, when Dr. Guja is going very slow, you can see the stent is collapsing on itself, and uh, and you can see that this, this could be that this could be some thrombus here, and and uh, you know obviously he's putting a lot of pressure. I'm worried about my filter wire, but you saw that he buried it all the way in the pop, I mean in the in, in the, the foot. PT, yeah. So it's definitely going to be it's definitely going to come back a little. I I've accepted it. 30 seconds. I I I've, I've accepted it, and we're going to check the wire every now and then, just to make sure that I haven't pulled it back too much because I do have to give him a good rail. And the wire is very yeah, good. Yeah, I'm very happy with my rail. 
So now we're going to go again. So I think I think that I think definitely um, you know uh, Sandeep, I think this is an issue. So now Warren's definitely coming back, but that's so, okay. Uh, you know the the issue here is that you know what what are we going to do with cases like this? I'm just going to push the wire so down a little. Couple bit. of Hold things, on. you know, uh, Doctor Shin, you said okay. uh, mm -hmm. bypass is not an option, but mm -hmm. uh, let, let just being devil's advocate and you know keeping all the possibilities. I want to make sure Asma mentioned this stent was placed in 2015, yes. and I want to make sure this is the first failure. Is that right? It Asma? is the first yes. failure. Oh, okay, so that. Oh. You know, uh, and it's there enough. is no data, but I think the general practice, you can correct me and, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Guja can uh, factor in. Uh, I think we oh, at wow. least give uh, two or three endovascular trial therapies oh. before we say, you know, this would be a candidate for a bypass. Our filter. Up top, off. Our sheath is good. So, yes. Sandeep, you know, uh, I, I understand part of it is based go. on uh, experience. You know, PK, I think, has a lot of experience more than uh, anybody else, but... See, um, no, it's uh, not going. Yeah, it's not going. Okay. Fire product. Okay, go turn, no, come, come off back on. No, but the so question, what? What I should say is, see, I bypass, think. bypass has a good data, right? It's not like bypass doesn't have a good data. Right. The only reason we shied away from bypass is, uh, we had other therapies which started giving better results than bypass. Right. 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 That's the reason bypass. But most has of them are drug coated. That's you know right. that's why that's why we have this context Please now. Sir. No, actually, even even our bare metal stenting was as close to good as bypasses. I mean, superior data is as close to good as bypasses. But within a stent, IS, uh, would no, you do ISR. A, uh, See, ISR is what makes the difference, right? Yeah, right. So exactly. I think uh, around you, Karthi. No, um, I'm saying this way, this way. I, so I in think, an ISR setting, right? uh, or you want to come around? No, this way. I'm not aware of any uh, for an ISR, uh, like a first or an Everflex stent. Is there any data for a no. superapotency? No, right? No, that's there's no. Be too much the, lumen occlusion. The only data for ISR is, is with is DCB. It, is it, yeah. DCB uh, and, and Zilver PTX. And, and Zilver PTX. And, 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 and Reline. So those yeah. three therapies, right? right? As a definitive therapy, we have to <laughs> exactly. talk about. Yeah. So I think if the patient, I think that's we have to take it as a, saline. PK always says, you have to take the patient into consideration. If the patient yeah, is a claudicant, right? So I think we can consider what we are doing now with atherectomizing it, opening it up. Now there's no DCB, you can reline the stent. Uh -huh. That makes sense. Dogo. But if the patient is a critical limb patient and you're looking at long-term patency, considering bypass, especially if with a good target, uh, I think it's not a bad idea at oh, all. Oh, 100%. This get, is right? a great idea here. Yeah. If somebody has a good target, <coughs> I would not even reline the stent. There's no reason to. I think uh, if, you if you really look at the data-wise, I think uh, your bypass gives you a best best result than anything else. Potency, but you know, uh, now I'm not a surgeon, but uh, no. you talk to any surgeon, and yeah. the reason this yep, field evolved out. in endovascular terms is go, turn because of the morbidity mortality 60, with all 60, these procedures. Go. Okay, yeah. good. All right, guys. So we're, we're gonna be—it's gonna be a little loud. So Sandeep, why don't you talk, and okay. uh, maybe they can mute our microphones. You can tell them what they're doing because we're gonna laser. So that's here. the laser, and uh, what are we using? Uh, to go elite. So we are, yeah. Two, three. Two, two three. three. And we are going 60, 60 on the pulse. 60, 60. Okay. okay. So that's another therapy, you know, and that's based on the Excite ISR. Uh, it was a trial where they did a, in the instant restenosis uh, arm, they used uh, two is to one randomization. They used laser Did plus PTA or a PTA yeah. alone. And the, uh, there was a significant uh, difference. And I believe the enrollment was stopped early because uh, laser plus uh, uh, PTA had a better uh, primary potency at one year as compared to uh, a PTA alone. And uh, it's a very standard therapy we use in our lab, and this would be an ideal case to uh, use this. Now, so this is vessel prep. We did a thrombus uh, thrombectomy, followed by now, you know, we are working on whatever ISR tissue is there. Now, the question would arise is, as we alluded to, there are three. Uh, definitive therapies in this case, endovascular wise. One is uh, drug-coated balloons. You know, I don't see anything that's wrong in this high-risk case. Yeah. That's Number two would be uh, Zilver PTX. Would, uh, and third would be uh, relining this. So once they are done with the ISR, uh, with the laser, uh, we'll like to have opinion from Dr. Goja and Dr. Krishnan. <coughs> See, I think uh, when you're relining the stent, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people might be wondering off. Oh. Yeah, what are, so the, what's the big concern with the relining? I think that's uh, you know that's so, uh, the better way of addressing. So I the think a lot of people may be wondering why atherectomize it, why prep it. I think prepping on the relining of the stent makes complete sense because you want a complete expansion of whatever stent you want. Mm -hmm. And uh, instant restenosis, as everybody knows, is not just regular atherosclerosis. There is a lot of fibrotic tissue. Mm -hmm. 
and if you don't uh, atheritomize it, debulk it nicely, then your stent expansion is not good. There is a big layer of uh, atherosclerotic plaque between your reline stent and your initial stent. That decreases the lumen of. Now that brings up a question: After a laser and less cavity capture, would you do angioscult in this? So that's that's what. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think we have to change. Uh, A yeah, wire is yeah, coming yeah. back. Wire, wire moved Get us another wire here, guys. Just any wire. Yeah, let's try to. So sometimes buddy wiring will help, and Guja is going to just try to move it down. Which uh, it, I think filters fine. Your wires away. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, wire came, came back. Yeah. Wire came back. Push wire the wire down. Back. Yeah, excellent. So I think this so is very important with the good. Excellent. Okay, that's fine. So that's yeah, the beauty yeah. of uh, Ambush Shield filter. And that's, that's the Abbott perfect. filter. Excellent. The wire is independent of the yeah, wire uh, is independent of the filter there you go. basket. There you go. So we're gonna put another uh, uh, what is it called um, wire to try to deflect it off mm -hmm. the uh, wall just to create so a little bit more central luminal stiffness. Yeah, as a, you want to put a non hydrophilic wire when exactly. you put the second wire. Uh, pretty pretty uh, be definitely better one would be a steel core wire. Which, uh, I, which I hate, by the way. <laughs> that's my 10 cents there. That's the only, that's the only place where PK uses a steel no, core wire. No, no, PK never uses a steel core wire. <laughs> it's, a, it's a piece it's of... It's an Abbott wire, 018, a lot of body, but, uh, you know, uh, I think. My daughter has a nice saying, it's a piece of poo-poo. <laughs> and that's exactly what a steel core is. Sorry, Abbott. Well, some, some people love it, but that's fine. <laughs> <you know? laughs> All right, ready, let's see now. So we're going to go right now with it. Okay, let's hope it goes. Uh, and you know, I think this would be a critical segment where laser matters. A lot of fibrotic tissue on the start and end of uh, resynotic segment. No, no. Yeah, we're not going to be able to do it. No. So we're going to go with uh, now an angioscope. Get yeah. us a long angioscope, guys. So, so I think I think uh, you know at this stage you could you could use a balloon where we're filter protected it, which I'm really happy with. Not that, that that completely allows you to take a Should deep breath. Should we take breath. a filter picture? Or I know <laughs> the grad is elevated. It's elevated, so yeah, Asma wants to wait. You know, Asma's Asma is okay. very much a patient advocate, and we love her for it. <laughs> yes. And she said, listen, you know, let's wait. And <laughs> I agree good. with her. Okay. You know, and I think there's a right. not having any pain or anything. No, so no pain, good. no okay. nothing. Everything is good. Yeah. Um, what's that? You want me to walk it out? Yeah. yeah. So, and then, and then you don't have to worry about it. I got it. You don't have to worry about the filter. No, I'm gonna, yeah. um, so, as we walk this out, what, what, what we're going to do now is go with an angioscope, balloon it with an angioscope and then take a filter picture. Now, this is the part that everybody needs to be aware of. This is the most, how can you say, chance where this thing is going to embolize, right? So you can see here that everything, everything, if it embolizes, it's going to embolize now, and that's why your filter has to be right. Second thing you also have, Senor no Muyava, second thing you have to understand is all the vessel prep that we've done is to minimize the embolization in this case. So hopefully at this stage, we're, we're, we've done enough vessel prep, we've burned off all that free-floating thrombus and stuff like that to be able to prevent this. Ray, you need to come off, uh, go back on pressure. And, uh, and somebody go back on pressure for me. Turn off the saline bag over there. Oh, we can do it? Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. So, so that's the reason why I think it's very important to do vessel prep in this case. It's hard to publish a, a protocol. I mean, uh, Dr. Singla has been talking about it. Dr. Gujo wants to do it. I think we have a very good protocol. But even with that protocol, it's very difficult at times in these kind of cases to predict what's going to happen. And let's see whether, whether this, this goes. Even this is having trouble going, as you can see, with Dr. Gujo pushing this. I'm going to try to, OK, let's balloon here, and then we'll no, take it down. So we need to balloon to break this cap. This is a 60200 sculpt. So it's a atherotomy uh, balloon from uh, Spectrenetix. Yes. Uh, uh, from Philips now. Philips now, yeah. So you can see, see all the. Yeah. There you go. That's the reason why it's going like, to. You're going to have to really crack. Senor, no te mueva, por favor. So he's going to have a lot of pain, as you know, when you're doing these atherotomy type devices. And this is where they embolize a lot. So, so uh, asthma is going up to you know, high pressure because you have to here. You really have to crack it. Yeah. You know, you're within the stent. The likelihood of, of, of rupture is very low. And uh, she's going to keep cranking it till that expands even better. That's a nice expansion other than that area. Yeah, that area is. So, so you, you yeah, can almost tell the mechanism of failure. Yeah. You know, you can see that that's why this failed. Mm -hmm. And Asma is only at 12. I'm going to tell her to go to 20 slowly. You can actually look Floral. at that stent deformation right at that point. I don't think it's a fracture, no, but it's uh, definitely one, one a stent deformation. There you go, you got it. I have is Down. Let's say, let's say this patient had multiple stent fractures. 
Right. Would your definitive therapy and let's ignore Castano's uh, data. Uh -huh. you know, let's let's talk uh, one year back. Uh -huh. Multiple stent down. fractures. Go There's a, a long segment ISR, CTO ISR. You Can know, we here? know we know from data from peripheral data that if this is a lesion which has the highest risk of re re stenosis. Long segment uh, stent uh, stent ISR. Whatever therapy we offer. We so, so you know what? Before we talk about that, I know uh -huh. Asma's done an incredible job of preparing okay. things. Yeah, that's, that's so let's uh, let Asma, uh, you know, seriously, she, yeah, she put a lot of effort yeah. into it, and I, I, I think I know, I think that uh, you know, me and Asma have this, uh, you know, we rib each other all the time, so that's why Ray's laughing. But, but I think that uh, down, I think that you know, this would be a good opportunity for her to go over this data in the context of what's going on, and we can all put it together in the context of what's going on. So Asma, oh. why don't you present while Ray takes over here, Flora? Uh, go to the slides, guys. Yep. Okay. A little higher. All right. So, um, so we, I'm, I'm, I'm right basically going to talk about what PK just said, the treatment of ISR in the context of the the new uh, Dr. Castano's meta-analysis. So we talked about this uh, meta-analysis two live cases ago at nauseam, and we dissected the paper, and you know we we said that there was the the conclusion of this paper. That was um, was that there's an increased risk of death following application of paclitaxel coated balloons and stents in the fempop artery of the lower extremities, and their conclusion was that further investigations warranted. And we know that what came off of this was um, FDA's newsletter, which was bad news for everybody. Next, so at one year, essentially there is um, uh, there's equal poise, no difference in the types of therapies. Next, hmm. yeah, at two years. Uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, there's some, you know, th uh, there's some uh, divergence. You know, there's a relative risk of 3.5 percent, uh, and number needed to harm is 29 in the group that received drug-coded therapy. Next, and at five years, this becomes even more so. Surprisingly, 7.7.2 7 percent risk difference in the therapies, and number needed to harm is very, very low. <laughs> it's it's 14 patients um, so 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 the crude risk of death in and those treated with non drug coded therapies was 8.1 versus 14.7 in patients who were treated with drug coded therapies so next uh, so so basically uh, with with that in mind and the FDA newsletter in mind we I'm, I'm just going to discuss this uh, uh, this is just a uh, just a uh, pick, you know, a, a slide about why we use filter, and this is from uh, our lab, Dr. Christian's paper, that basically showed the why we use filter, and, and all ISRs, um, and almost all ISRs, we recommend using a filter. Next, um, so this is uh, this is uh, you know, in keeping with the topic, this was Elite uh, Excite ISR, which used, uh, which basically was a trial that was a prospective randomized multicenter trial that showed, uh, if, uh, you know, for clinical evaluation of eczema laser etherectomy. So essentially, um, they wanted to evaluate the safety and efficacy of uh, PTA versus uh, eczema laser and PTA in fempop restenosis. Um, so, uh, so, so uh, you know, as, as Sandeep said, it was a two to one randomization and, you know, they're uh, uh, next, you know, they, um, they they looked at the primary safety endpoint as well as efficacy endpoints of uh, binary restenosis as determined by ultrasound return of clinical symptoms and uh, you know deterioration of ABI and Rutherford class. Next, so um, there was uh, you know in in the in the uh, in the laser group uh, there was there was basically the more technical uh, 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 procedural success, uh, which was statistically significant. Residual stenosis of less than 30% was less in the laser group versus PTA alone, as we would expect more luminal gain with laser and uh, diameter, uh, you know, uh, and, um, uh, 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 and, and distal protection. Uh, this so the, the, the problem was that obviously with laser, there was a little bit more distal embolization, but not, not uh, statistically significant. Uh, next, so um, these are the procedural uh, complications uh, that uh, that uh, are between the two group two groups. All the procedural complications, including any dissections, greater than grade C dissections, bailout stenting, thrombosis, and abrupt closure, they were less in laser group, statistically significantly less. And the only thing that we see more for reds is distal embolization, which was 
uh, numerically more, but it did not come out to be statistically significant. Uh, next. So now this is again saying, showing the primary patency, uh, you know, at, 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 uh, at 365 days, uh, basically uh, uh, the yellow one being PTA and the blue one being PTA plus laser, it's, uh, it's significantly better for laser. Next. Again, freedom from TLR also significantly better for laser. Th next. So again, their conclusion was that in eczema laser with adjunctive PTA is superior for treatment of ISR as, as compared to PTA alone. And um, you know, uh, the, the they were all complicated lesions averaging about 19 centimeters, so real world lesions, and significantly higher procedural success of 93% as compared to only 82% with PTA and significantly higher um, uh, safety of laser as, as well as, uh, you know, a, and, uh, and significantly lower rates of TLR in the laser group were noted. So, so it's a therapy, so, you know, that, that's why uh, in, in our lab we, we use it based, based on evidence. We use, uh, uh, we use laser for, for almost all ISRs. Next. Uh, now, this is what we were just talking about, the reline data, which is using endoprosthesis or Vibound for a treatment of ISR. Next. So uh, again, so this was a uh, was a trial of uh, Gore's Gore's Wyburn, um, stent, uh, and and it uh, it was basically a multicenter randomized trial comparing Wyburn with Wyburn with PTA. Um, so essentially, uh, you know, uh, looked at uh, instant restenosis and uh, in, uh, in again in fempop uh, segment. It looked at, uh, so essentially the inclusion criteria was any restenotica occluded segment located inside okay. a stent that was placed at least 30 days ago. And uh, again, the lesion lengths were from four to 27 centimeters. And uh, they needed for this, uh, for to be uh, enrolled in the study, they needed at least one centimeter healthy zone so that uh, distal and proximal so that we'd be able to, uh, you know, uh, um, place the endoprosthesis for, for her to have a landing zone. Again, um, uh, uh, and the popliteal artery had to be patent at least uh, from you know f uh, the inter uh, from uh, from the distal fem to P3 segment, and and again, which is kind of wha uh, what our patient is here today, and and there should have been at least endographic evidence of at least one vessel runoff, so that uh, so that the Y bond stays open. Next, uh, again, this is showing that the two arms were pretty comparable. PTA and Vibon arm, next. And this shows that at one year, uh, significantly better primary patency and freedom from TLR in the Vibon group, which was around 75% as compared to like 20% primary patency in the PTA only. And then the freedom from TLR was like, again, almost 80% for the Vibon arm versus only 42% for the PTA arm. Next. Now. Here's the here's the problem. Now that's impact data again. Oh no so no no we, relax, relax. you know, uh, I, I have to mention this because this was their um, this was their uh, their imaging uh, imaging uh, uh, subset uh, an imaging registry. So we uh, and and the problem is now with the with in context of uh, the meta analysis how how we are going to use this data and how we are going to implement this therapy in the treatment of ISR. So again, um, you know. Um, our re regular risk factors, 67, you know, was the mean age, and regular risk factors, you know, pretty pretty standard patients for us. Next, so um, uh, you know, and the, uh, there were about 150 patients in the ISR group. Their length, uh, their length was again same, around 17 centimeters, uh, you know, or so, which was pretty much the standard in the other two as well. We saw uh, out of these, 34 percent was CTOs, kind of like our patient. And um, you know, so so essentially, they said that at, at one year they looked at these patients, and I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. So they uh, this is the immediate uh, uh, success, clinical success, uh, and uh, rate of provisional stenting was low. Clinical success was high, 98 percent. Procedural success was 99 percent. Next, and and this looked at uh, this since this is just a single arm study, so it just you know it looks at the uh, the primary patency at one year, which was pretty good actually 88 percent for for around 20 centimeter lesions which is which is the real world lesions which and and that's you know that uh, that 
and and that uh, they have uh, you know 88 uh, percent primary patencies is pretty good at uh, at that point. Next, and then um, again, this is uh, freedom from clinically driven TLR, which is excellent as well. It's 90. Uh, nine, um, around 93% at, at one year. Next. Um, so again, uh, you know, any, uh, this is any major complications, uh, b pretty low. And it's interesting here, all cause death at uh, one year is 0%. Uh, they didn't have any deaths, but you know, n n but and, and n no major, and no major complications, you know, made no, no major limb losses, again, 0% amputations. So overall, very good. Next. Again, now they, they suggested from this that you know that that there's safety and efficacy of impact uh, uh, impact or or DCB therapy for long complex ISR lesions. Uh, you know, like I mentioned, 12 month primary patency of around nine around eight, around 90 percent and uh, 12 month uh, clinically directed TLR rate of only 7.3 percent. So therefore, confirming safety and efficacy of impact in ISR. Next. And this was again impact data about uh, debate ISR. Their one year data was pretty good again. Next. Uh, next. But it just shows that at, at three years, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, the it, although it's still better than PTA, but there's a, uh, 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 this is still at one year, I'm sorry. And at, at three years, go to next, please. At three years, there's a catch up, and essentially, they are, there's, there's equal poise between patients who were treated with balloon angioplasty and DEB, but, but we know that, you know, that uh, this, this disease is going to reoccur. Next. Uh, again, now this is uh, the, the Zilver ISR uh, paper and, you know, treatment of uh, SFA ISR with Zilver PTX. So again, single arm study out of the 900 uh, Zilver patients, uh, 142 treated were ISR patients. You know, their, their lengths were not that long, around, uh, around 12 to 13, but, you know, uh, nevertheless, you know, they, they looked at um, uh, kind of a task A to D was, uh, uh, you know, equally distributed, um, and about 30, uh, one third of the patients had actually longer lesions of more than 15%, and 30% of these were CTOs. And uh, next, so again, it shows that at one year, kind of comparable to the DCB, which is uh, which was also 90 percent, uh, 90 percent prime uh, uh, free freedom from TLR, next, and primary patency of of that same range as well. Uh, next, that that's all I have. So, Thank so you. I think that's an yeah. excellent overview of that's been put together, and I think in the context of today's case. It's going to bring up a lot. So let me tell you what me and Dr. Guja did when Dr. Uh, when Asma was pre presenting that eloquent uh, presentation. <clears throat> so if you looked at what happened, we did a. Um, I guess we didn't we didn't see everything. We did an angioscope of the entire thing. Angioscope would not cross past the 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 T on uh, you know uh, tell tape or whatever it is called glow tell tape, glow and tell tape. Yeah, the T on tell. So we went with a um, uh, six o fifteen. Viatrack, which is a renal balloon, uh, 014 system from Abbott. We went ahead and we had a balloon angioplasty to everything. And we, we had to go to really high pressure at this level, which showed that the mechanism of failure, at least in our minds, was probably distal with severe fibrotic instant restenosis, where we couldn't even cross, as you guys saw the live part of the case, and, and, and then leading to total occlusion of the entire stand and likely proximal fibrosis because Dr. Guja and I had a real difficult time not real difficult, we had a difficult time trying to get through the proximal cap we had to use an 014 Confianza, which you all saw online. So, so there's a proximal mechanism of failure, in our opinion, and a distal, and look what played out. So we always take a filter shot, as Dr. Asma said. Uh, we went ahead and did a filter shot, which shows great flow in the filter. See the goober in the filter? There's always goober in the filter. And then now you see what's, what you see here, Sandeep. You see that excellent flow of the stent up to the area where, where we talked about in the distal where we had trouble, right? And if you look at proximally, which I'm sorry, uh, he's moving a little here. When you, when you look at proximally right here, again, excellent flow in the stent. So my question now, if you're looking at this, what do you do? You know, uh, I can't hear you. Now, now tell me, what do you do? Do you realize? Now, now let, let me go over the options because Osman did a great job, right? And we all have to say that it was a phenomenal presentation. So let's talk about this. So according to Dr. Kalik, we could do 
three line. We could do, and I'll have her just summarize the data a little bit on the primary patencies, reline, we could do impact, or we could do Zilver PTX, right? We know laser balloon at one year falls off. So, so that's what we've done here. We've done laser balloon. So we know that we have less than important patencies at one year here. So do we consider patency the fact that he has very superficial wounds that likely will heal, heal in three months because of this? Or do we go for uh, longer patency with the data that we have with the other options? So my question, Asma, is in, you're now, next year, you're in your practice, you get this patient, you do everything you, you know how to do. What's your decision based on the current situation right now? What would so, you do here? So if, I just, if we just look at the data, there's actually equipoise between all those modalities. A laser was 78% prime, laser PTA was 78% primary patency and freedom from TLR at one year. And uh, the other therapies were around like uh, the PTX and uh, uh, the Zilber PTX and uh, DCB, they were around 90%. And uh, Realign was somewhere in between the two. So in my mind, there is not much difference, but I, I mean, since there was a distal mechanism of failure, maybe I will distally do a DCB, and then, uh, you know, uh, obviously we did laser, PTA for the rest, distally do a DCB and, you know, give him more flow and see how he does. Okay, we have one vote, uh, which I think is very good logic, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so Asma says, distal, distal DCB, great flow otherwise, L leave him alone. Karthik? Yeah, I would, uh, I would actually reline the distal area with another stent. Um, just because Asma said it's a DCB, <laughs> but uh, I, somebody has to say something different. No, I'm you don't. Say, Come on, no, no. no, no, no I want to know what you really no, no, do. I, I would, I would, I would personally <laughs> would say I would agree with Asma, but the question is what's happening at the distal level, right? It's, is it just restenosis? I feel like there is a <coughs> there, is, there is a distortion of the stent. It's not a fracture, but it's a distortion of the stent. So relining it with the Zillow PTX or any other stent, I think Zillow PTX is a reasonable decision to do. Is not a bad idea. Okay. Or is this the first restenosis? Yes. yes. It's the first restenosis. So, if keeping that in mind and it's superficial wounds, you have a great flow, three vessel runoff. I think um, DCB is also not a bad option at all. But would you DCB the entire stent or just that no, focal? No, I vessel? would just do the focal. focal and would you do the distally. proximal as well or no? So the proximally, if you see, they missed the ostium. The ostium is not covered. So just for that ostium level, I would probably go with a short DC. But, but, but if you look at where, and this is what I want to, before I get yeah. to you, Sandeep, I think this is an important point yeah. for all of us to see how that, uh, that proximal, this is just crossing up and over. You can see <coughs> you here, see yeah. you can see the nub never yeah. got occluded. Yeah, never right. So occluded. It, it was not that they did anything yeah. wrong. I think that it, this is pure yes. ISR, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so standing to the ostium you, with this angle, you may disrupt the this profunda, God yeah. forbid, right? Yeah. <coughs> so, so, I, so, that, so, okay, that's two. Sandeep, what about you? So I would, uh, in this case, uh, first failure, I would go with DCB. I want to take a look at the distal picture just to make a comment. If there are a lot of collaterals coming off at that area, you know, now, now, here, now it's very important to see the distal picture pre yeah. because I think it's going to change your mind and that's what I wanted you guys to point out yeah. to the audience. You see this, see the stent ends and then distal to the stent there is disease, there's native vessel disease. You see that? Yeah. And as Dr. Guja said, that, that, that right above that collateral there's about 20 millimeters of disease. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so to me that has to be just, you know, dealt with because that's part of the mechanism of failure. Yeah. Right, so I think that you know proximal plus minus. You can either DCB it or leave it alone. The rest of the stent, I don't. I think failed because of what happened here. So I, this is part of the reason. Any role for Ivis Karthik? So I don't think. I mean, uh, I I'm think I, I, I personally don't think there's a role of Ivis after okay. what we found with the flow. Uh, I mean, if he had difficulty expanding that area, I think Ivis would have made made sense to see what to do at more atherectomy, more debulking or just distortion of the stand. But at this point of time, my only concern is there is a 20 millimeter segment there. You have a good landing zone. You can you land it before that geniculate collateral. Right. I think you will be safe. You won't lose that collateral as long as you don't use a covered stand. Well, but the question now is why not use a covered stand? You have three vessel runoff, right? It's, it's a prosthetic bypass above knee, which is reasonable, right? At least, uh, you know, a lot of surgeons believe in covered stenting. Um, you know, I heard about it at PALP, which is, I thought was a great meeting. And congrats to Dr. Schneider. But I really thought that you know th there's a lot of there's a lot of data on on cover. We're going to talk about it in Link Monsai. So Dr. I think Schneider if you're using a covered stent PK, you have to stent the whole segment. 
Right. Um, yes. That's that's my own. That's, that's my only concern. Sure. Yep. Right. You can't just use a focal covered stent yeah, just to cover that area, and now you're putting yourself at higher risk for thrombus, right? Yeah. Well, long if you're but, long-term but, risk of uh, thrombus. But yeah. I don't know if that really pans out. You know, I think if you talk to the people unlike us who use a lot of covered stents, they would tell you that that doesn't really pan out in, in their in their data. You have a good uh, so landing zone. So 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 my my, my question is. You know that has to be part of the algorithm, as Asma said. It is, you know, equivocal, right? It's it's not that you have a lot of differences. So okay, what? So I, the other question, one last question before we do it, because when we do it, it'll be hopefully done quick. How do you deal with the antiplatelet, antithrombotic therapy in this patient, especially with the compass data? You know, this that's is why a, I'm asking. It's very relevant. He was on Eliquis and Plavix. He was. Mm -hmm. So okay. Yeah. So he was a compass patient. Modified compass. Yeah. So okay. we'll, now we'll switch him to Zeralto and Plavix. Two point five. I think everybody agrees. Today. Okay. So now, okay, Sandeep, what do you think, DCB or stent? Now, looking at the distal landing zone. You know, with the data, uh, uh, I would go with the this uh, DCB. Asma already said it. I agree okay. with Guja. I'm going with the Zilver PTX. PTX. Okay. And I'll tell you my logic okay. why. My logic why is you have distal dissection and, you, and you've got that distal dissection is going to, if that, God forbid, closes, you, we don't know, understand the mechanism of DCB failure. And you know, I know you've been working with Medtronic on this and hopefully we'll continue working when you're in Columbus, uh, is, that, is that we want to be able to get to that by looking at the angiograms. I have a feeling dissection at this grade uh, would cause a failure at this level. Yeah. And, and Guja and I, went, uh, we ruptured the Viatrac balloon going up so high in that area. So I think we will go ahead and put a stent, a scaffolding. So, uh, so the length of the scaffolding, Dr. Gooch, we want to cover up to maybe the T? 120, yeah. Yep, get us a 60120 silver PTX, please. And they have a good potency also. You have an incompletal segment. Silver has a good potency. Yeah, so, and, uh, and the fracture rates reason. fracture yeah. rates uh, are 1.8% after three years, and they remain stable, so, uh, stable uh, at so this length. See, look at this area. Uh, Look at this area, there, right? Yeah, right there. The look at that bend there. Yeah. Look at the e distortion of the yeah. stent. Yeah. In the if you if you look at the links of this stent, One. this is yeah. most likely an Everflex stent, right? The way it, it is. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. yeah. So look at the links of the stent. See that expansion and distortion there. That's going to be our mechanism of failure. And of course, as but, but, said, there's distal dissection. Yeah. So that's definitely going to be a problem too. You have to line this area, no matter what, if you want to get a good result. So I think what is that long enough, Karthik? No, it's not long enough. Uh, one second. Yeah, well, you open it. It's okay. We can open uh, another one. Because that's what? That's from 25, that's 25 to all the way to uh, 120. Yeah. Okay, fine. You can take a 140 if you want to take you get a 140. Let's yeah. be safe. Yeah. Karthik knows I failed math. So he's, <laughs> he's always, he's always <laughs> nice to me. <laughs> so you're going to end it right uh, below 5. Send we're going to land it above the collateral. Yeah. 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 So I, I do want to say we're missing Dr. Sardar Farhan in this case. Yeah, we're missing Dr. You know, Kapoor. And Dr. Okay. Kapoor, who's on, who's on vacation as always. <laughs> no, but I'm serious. I, I, I want to send out a message to Vishal that, that Dr. Sharma is looking for him. <laughs> you know, for, I, th I think for the first time, more than, I will more than be anybody, I was looking for him. I you was know, not told I'll be moderating. <laughs> I think, oh. Sandeep, for the first time, I will not be blamed if the wire comes back. <laughs> I'm not being blamed for this because I'm in the front. You know, you know the, fu the funny thing is, uh, I got to I gotta tell you, roll we get so roll. much food feedback from everyone, uh, you know, and part of the, the part that they love about our, our transmission is that it really is a, a fun environment and, they, and everybody learns. I mean, we do have a good audience and, uh, you know, it's part of the fun. So we, everybody knows we're just picking on Dr. Kapoor, but, you know, he does take too much vacation. <laughs> That's true, That's though. It is true. That's, That's true, though. He does take too much vacation. But come on, come on. Trouble, right? Not going? Come on, yeah. Come. yeah. Yeah, so this is, you know, you got that proximal bend off, off, off floor. Yeah. You got that proximal bend, which we kind of knew would give us trouble. And that's where yeah, Dr. Guja is having trouble. Maybe steel core may help. Yeah, maybe. Maybe, uh, maybe. I'm oh, sorry, my mistake. No. Yeah, get us, uh, get us a super core. We're still on bare wire. Yeah, just we're on a bare wire. Let's take this. Uh, you want to take the filter out? Yeah. All right, we're going to take the filter out here. Get us a filter capture device, guys. Yeah. Actually, you know what? Can we and and then we O three five trailblazer and just yeah. Get to go with an O three five trailblazer and then we pull the filter out. Will the filter come out totally through the trailblazer? No. No, right? No, it won't. You have to use a a guide. Guide, multi-purpose guide. 
Definitely, they can rewire it. They can rewire it. Yeah, yeah but I'm just worried about that distal dissection. So now, while Karthik does this job, uh, let you and I talk, uh, uh, Sandeep. Mm -hmm. So tell me, um, in terms of the proximal segment, are you concerned? Okay, you can hold it. You know, uh, so typically what happens is uh, the fibrotic, uh, the, the, uh, the failure of any restenosis long segment is the distal and proximal ends. Typically, you get a fibrotic lesion there. And in the middle segment, you get uh, more of thrombotic, uh, you know, stagnation flow, which becomes a thrombus. And that we know from how the wire crosses. In this case also, you had... And when you expanded the balloon, there was an area which was not expanding up on the top, and the distal you had so much uh, difficulty. No, no, proximal actually expanded quite well. Dr. Guja and I there was felt no, that. No difficulty at all? No, it no, expanded no, quite well. Just the band. That's the issue. Uh, I, you know, I would not put another with that good of angiographic result. You want to confirm in another view? I would not put, uh, if you're asking another uh, therapy, I would limit uh, yeah, DCP or uh, another scaffold there. Yeah, uh, that's and another thing we can do is after uh, putting the distal stent, give some nipride, take a picture. If the flow is like really good, I would leave it alone. Honestly. Yeah, I think I think that's what we're gonna do too. Yeah, no, we'll go with the super. Uh, but it's interesting, you know, uh, when Asma presented data, all the therapies. Uh, let's start with the. Uh, let's start with excite. Uh, Cycle ISA. cuff guys. So that's one. You know, potency is seventy-eight percent. You know, one year. Then let's go to a silver PTX about seventy-eight percent. You know, we we are leaving a scaffold there. A reline, you are leaving a scaffold with the, if I, I don't remember the numeric numbers, but my concern with the reline data was, out of 100 patients, there were about six or seven stent thrombosis. And, you know, uh, it's not reflected in the guidelines. If you look at, uh, there was a question actually, one of my friends from India asked, Dr. Baduria asked, that the guidelines still say aspirin lifelong plavix one month. You know, that doesn't apply to this case or uh, all the hype. And so reline, you know, my biggest concern is the antithrombotic long-term risk. And of all the data we have, uh, the impact, uh, which was one year, uh, like a 90% primary potency, that's excellent. This Now the Castano's paper puts a little slowdown on it. So, you know, I think that's a real concern here. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I think uh, while well, Dr. Guja just was wired with an 035 uh, uh, super core, as you saw, so now he's going to go ahead and, and place the stand. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I, I, I think that the two things that we all should discuss uh, is, can you guys shut her in, guys, just to make sure? Yeah. Uh, it, it, two things that we should discuss is the value of maximum medical therapy on these patients, which I think we kind of, you know, we talk about the technical aspects of success and so on and so forth. I think in this gentleman, you know, what Dr. Kalik was saying, that the fact that he was on, uh, you know, yeah, like a modified uh, NOAC sure. therapy is very concerning, you know? So I really think this is a mechanical failure. I think that NOAC helped the, the stent from not thrombosing completely. And I think that the, that's why the mm -hmm. proximal aspect, we were able to, uh, the mid aspect, uh, we got such a nice result. So I think that this is a mechanical cause for failure. <clears throat> I think the outflow is favorable for him, obviously. And I think, I think that's gonna help us to keep this open. I think it's very important technically to achieve a good result here, as Dr. Guja is planning on doing. Uh, it's very important also to, is to keep that collateral open, which I think is the reason why we were able to do. What's up with my pressure, guys? Oh, nitro. Okay. Um, it, it, I think it's very, very important, and I think these are the things. So we're gonna, he's going to go right now, and he's going to place the stent. So you can see here, he's going to be very, uh, around five is what we discussed. Right around there. Yeah, it should be fine. Maybe even a little lower is okay. And then he's going to make sure we're on the 25 mark, which is another question that we wanted to see. He'll do another roadmap here. He just wants to make sure the collateral is okay. We can come a little lower too. That's okay. I think that's fine. Okay, that's fine. Come up a little higher. I, I would come off and make sure you cover the proximal aspect too. Above. This is 140, right? So. 140, yeah, uh, 6 or 140, I think that's what. Okay, perfect. Yeah. You covered it. Great. All right. So, uh, I, I, you know, that Zeralto issue is, is, a, is definitely something that I think we have to address. Now, I think in the last uh, ACC session, uh, they came out with this uh, Eliquis plus uh, Plavix data in the right. setting of AFib. And their uh, bleed risk, I don't know the exact numbers, perfect. but they had a better uh, bleeding profile uh, risk. So. You know, we have, uh, I think the NOAC is an evolving field and it's very applicable to high risk multi segment, uh, multi uh, organ uh, PAD involvement. So we'll see how it plays. Yeah, it says 60120 Dorado. Yeah, see, th that area is still uh, yeah, under yeah, expand. Yeah. yeah. 
This looks good. Even this area right there where uh, yeah, Kartik pointed out. Yeah. I mean, listen, we can only do the best we can do, right? I think I think we'll now post dollar with a 60120 Dorado, and then we'll take it. 60120, please. So Dorado is a high uh, pressure uh, uh, balloon from uh, BART. That's our standard uh, post del balloon. What do you have? If you don't have 120, what's the longest you have? 150? 150 is fine. That's fine. <clears throat> now, just a question. If this was a surgical candidate, let's say in future, you know, uh, would stent matter? And that, that's technically no. <clears throat> true, right? Well, so it doesn't well, matter. It's going to be a below knee bypass in case. No, it, no. it, it, no, it can still be an really above good. knee pop yeah. here. We, we yeah. have not burned the bridge. We didn't balloon the area uh, <laughs> below the uh, number five. And as that was long as you don't destroy the distal, distal pop, I think you're okay. Even no. proximal pop is absolutely okay with a lot of surgeons. Absolutely. No, no, yeah, but I mean, stent. proximal prop is pr preferred. Distal pop, I think Sean Leiden has shown some data that shows that uh, a baloney bypass using the distal pop also works. Okay. To me, this guy has three vessel runoff. We have a mechanism of failure. It's, one, it's a single failure. We improved the inflow and he developed an ulcer. So now he's critical limb. I think it's worthwhile to now open this, let him do uh, a maximum medical therapy. Follow. We, we would survey this guy very, very closely. And that's the last question yes. for all you guys before we end is surveillance. How would you survey this gentleman? I would go one, three, and six as usual, but definitely put him on Zaralto for sure. There's no doubt about yeah. that. How about you, uh, Sandeep? What do you think? So make, clinical, make sure it doesn't come out. So clinical ABI plus bit. duplex. Yeah. You know, I'll, in this case, even if he doesn't complain of any symptoms, even if ABIs don't fall, if I have a lesion which is, you know, a ratio are more well, than a two point four three yeah. range, I would uh, consider. I, in this case, I would like to maintain a, a primary assisted patency as much as possible. Right. So we're gonna we're gonna do ultrasounds every month till he heals. Yeah, and I would even do a like you know first ABI. Any drop more than 0.15 no, would yeah. be very significant in this patient. Go to 10, 20. I don't know. I, I don't know if ABI is uh, is the right move here. Uh, That's the extrapolation from you know what surgeons do with the grafts because uh, you know they're. Yeah, I know. But if yeah. you're talking about uh, stent patency and everything here, I think ultrasound is probably the right yeah. thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, his ABIs could be normal uh, yes. at so resting. Yes, that's the reason no. to add no. duplex. Yeah. All right, we did a, no. the stent is well, the balloon is yep. well expanded. Yep. So now we're going to take a picture. Now remember, you could still embolize. They're still caked on crud over there. This is the, the fear with, yeah. uh, with, uh, with these balloons, which are inferior in quality compared to the coronary balloons, because we've got to go with 035 systems. So I would, re I would reduce because manipulation as much as possible. <laughs> and now is when we all say our prayers and take a picture because if everything looks good now, meds. it'll be good. What's that? Meds. You want to do more meds? Yeah. Okay. The pressure is low. Yeah, just yeah. open up the fluids. No, no actually, no, it's yeah, okay. He, rec he recovered very well. EF is what? EF is poor. So he has a poor EF as well, so we got to be a little careful. Yeah. So, so just as a teaching point, Dr. Shin, we used uh, what sheets we used and what size, you know, so for we anybody the, who... We used the seven uh, mm -hmm. because we want to ha have the option to reline, Andrew Jet, bail out, everything yeah. that we need to do. Yeah. We always use sevens in these kind of cases. Yeah. Um, you know, and, you know, and when I show you the groin, you'll, 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 it's pretty ambitious. Yeah. You know, Dr. Asma correct, uh, corrected and was really honest because I think it was of a high risk groin to go with a seven. I'll show you off, Laura, please. And, and, you know, this guy has failed a common femoral endoarterectomy on the other side. So we had, the, the stent was placed uh, by, by our surgeons at this level, so, so just above. So, and, and, and you can see here the profundus is very diseased, so we had to go above it. And you can see that the, uh, the access yeah. point is very, very small, and he has significant profunda disease. So it, it's not something that, you know, you, you take lightly. I mean, these are very tough cases. Interesting. Right? Same, kind of a bend, same kind of a bend, but they came across the Tomorrow? ostium here, so... No, I think they came across the Austin because they had no choice. Yeah, I yeah. think it was flush occluded, you know? Okay. All right. Let's, 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 let's hope for the back. best. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Looks good. All right, DSA. Okay, okay. sitting. Sitting, I'll just go enough to see. Actually, let's start with the foot. Let's start with the foot. Okay, no more ever, senor. Oh, yeah, let's start with the foot. Any? Huh. All right, nice. Beautiful. All right, we're happy there. Yeah. 
And I think this is another discipline that's very important for everyone at home. Make sure you do your, your completion pictures. Don't leave the patient without, you know, what they started with. Before that. You know, and make sure that because you're working blindly on your wire, don't dissect the wire. Go up, please. Uh, I mean, don't, uh, don't, don't discard wire perfs. They do happen in the tibials, and you may end up having a, a, a uh, you know, critical limb ischemia yes. in the middle critical. of the night. That's just Should a spasm there, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, you know what? Okay. It's not perfect, yeah. but we didn't touch that area. Yeah. That so Dr. Critical. Dr. G and I saw felt not, oh, he's moving. Off, off, off. Yeah, he's moving. Yeah. So we have somebody to blame, you know, if he comes back. Asma told us not to use his drug coated balloon everywhere, so. No, I agree, you know, with us, mm -hmm. that in this case. <laughs> she can run, but she can't hide. We know where she is. Flora? <laughs> Floor, yeah, and the last picture. One, yeah. Now this is a very important picture. Yeah. We're going to take two views here. Yes. Right, Cindy? Because you don't want the mechanism of failure to be proximal something or another. Okay, so far so good. So now I'm going to go to higher mag. That area five looks a little, let's see. Well, I mean, you're right, I see that too, but let's go, yeah, let's just make sure. It's a bunch. Ah, yeah, there we go. Okay, Cindy? It's a bunch. Yep, it looks really pretty. Yeah, no dissection, we're done. So I think while we come out with this, I just want to summarize uh, for everyone. I mean, we, we did this case not really for the technical challenge of crossing an ISR, although there was a lot of technical pearls that we all learned together. We did this to really discuss how do we manage ISR in, the, in, the, in this paclitaxel era. And I think in this particular case, we, had, we identified a mechanism of failure, an area of restenosis that was focal. So we decided to go with a dr drug eluding stent, uh, in that in that particular area, and leave the rest of the stent alone. Now, now um, we're not we're not s claiming to believe Katsano's data that dose escalating dose resulted in higher restenosis because we felt his trial was uh, or his study was faulty in that manner for multiple different reasons that we went over during the case. But I think in this type of case, when you have a critical limb ischemia with a non-healing ulcer, the issue becomes is how do you deal with this? And you could see by, by Dr. Kalik summarizing the data, the discussion that we had today, you can see that there was a, there's no real clear algorithm and that your individual decision has to be tailor-made regarding uh, the patient. I think important considerations to the patient is how many times they've failed. Is this their first episode of restenosis, second episode of restenosis? What's their clinical syndrome? Are they critical limb? Are they, are they, are they, are they, are they um, you know, uh, claudic, claudicin? Third is, you know, are there any bypass options? Obviously, this gentleman's high risk. He has, uh, he has multiple other issues that would preclude bypass. So, therefore, that, uh, that's another issue to make, make sure. And then four is to have a discussion with the patient. I had spoken uh, to, to the patient, let him know that we'll do the best possible therapy yesterday. And he was, he was completely accepting of it. But I think in this particular case, you know, I think we, we, the, 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 the factor that makes me, how can you say, have confidence that we won't fail is the fact that we did identify a mechanism of failure distally, which involved um, a, a stent failure as well as a, an area of restenosis. The other thing also we have discussed very importantly is the, the role of dual antiplatelet therapy as well as um, antithrombotic therapy, and we're gonna put them on the, the follow the compass trial and put them on a NOAC, and then, and then we'll, we'll, see, we'll see how he does. But again, um, you know, this is uh, Dr. Dr. Singler's last case and uh, Dr. Kalik's second to last case. She'll be here at the end of June to say goodbye. But I think that, you know, uh, we've had a, an incredible year with Sandeep and, and Karthik and I and Vishal wish him all the best in, in, in Ohio. He's going to be a great success. And, and, and so we, we start with that. I end with, we'll see you at Link Mount Sinai. I think what you saw today is just a little smidgen of what you're going to see in, in the, over the next three days uh, in June 10th, 11th, and 12th at Link Mount Sinai. So, Dr. Guja, thank you for your wonderful expertise. I think Sandeep. And, you and, and great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye-bye. <laughs> so, uh, I just want to thank you, uh, Dr. Krishnan and his team, for this excellent uh, case. And it was uh, excellent teaching points, you know. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today for this case. Uh, we'll have the recording of this case available, uh, archived on www.ccclivecases.org. And uh, again, as a, a reminder, uh, we have a live peripheral intervention case every fourth Wednesday of the month at 8 a.m. Uh, but for June, we are doing the live case on Wednesday, the June uh, 19th. And uh, another second reminder is, as Dr. Krishnan pointed out, please remember to register for Link Mount Sinai 2019 and the Endovascular Fellows course on www dot link mount sinai dot org and www dot ccs 
symposium.org. Thank you all and have a good day. Bye.